Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you for another Sabbath day, and we, we thank you that we're able to meet together again. Uh, someday we will understand what a privilege it was to be able to quietly meet and to look over your word, have your spirit speak to us. We pray that we may be putting it in our mind and in our hearts. Someday our Bibles may be taken away from us. May we truly have them by heart at that time. We thank you now for being with us, for teaching us, for bringing us into places where our minds will be stretched, where we'll understand more of your book of Revelation. Help us, Lord, to be willing to go wherever you take us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We were at Daniel, the 12th chapter, last time. That's where we ended. I don't think we read the scripture. We dealt with the idea for about 25 minutes. But Daniel 12, 1 and 2, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. At that time... Thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now we dealt at uh, length on, on that last time, and I thought I would begin with that very same scripture, because I'm sure I hit you with some thoughts that we're not very familiar with to you. And I wonder if there are any questions. I don't want to leave you with a bunch of things floating in your head that you don't know where they land. <laughs> okay, if there are no particular questions, we'll move ahead. This scripture, by the way, is telling us in a kernel form that all humanity is going to get at least one look at Christ. So one way or another, everybody's going to see Christ. In this particular case, we have a special resurrection. Caiaphas, the high priest, is going to be raised. So he can see Jesus coming. Because Jesus said, you will see me come in the clouds. <laughs> so he has the privilege of being raised from the dead to see Jesus come the second time. But he won't just see him the second time. He's going to die again because the sight of seeing Jesus come is going to give him a massive heart attack down the road. He's going to die again. And he will be raised a third time when Jesus comes after the thousand years. So the wicked don't have a lot to look forward to except seeing Jesus several times, the ones in the special resurrection anyhow. Of course, the other ones in the special resurrection, it says some to life, and we talked about them. They will be raised glorified. These are the people who honored the law of God. These are in particular the Seventh-day Adventists who were faithful in the third angel's message, who died. They will be raised so that every Seventh-day Adventist will see Jesus come. Okay, we're looking at uh, Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. Okay. So, it says there that there is going to be a resurrection when Jesus comes a second time of two classes of people. It said, many of them that sleep in the dust. And by the way, notice that word many. This is not the general resurrection. This is a special resurrection. It says, they shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's two groups of people raised at this time. The people who fought God and the people who honored Him. They are both raised to see Jesus come. They're a special group that God told them, you are going to, to meet what you did in your life. You're going to see Jesus coming. So that's a very important point, but it leads in lots of places as we began to talk about last week. If you want to stay in this scripture the way it reads, 
You've got to put it together with Revelation 7 and Revelation 14 to see who these people are who are faithful. And we mentioned last time that in Great Controversy uh, 637, it tells us specifically that it's the people who are faithful in the third angel's message. And we ended by understanding what they're called. The Bible calls them something. The Spirit of Prophecy calls them something. The people who are resurrected and are living on the earth to see Jesus come are called the living saints. <laughs> okay? So don't think, as many people out there have gotten confused and say living saints means you never died. That is not what the term means. The term living saints means you're alive. That's all it means. <laughs> so living saint, according to early writings, are called 144,000. So all of the living saints on the earth when Jesus comes are called the 144,000. They are all Seventh-day Adventists. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean they all joined the church. <laughs> because there is coming a time when the church won't be a factor anymore. God will organize His people a way we are not familiar with. He will have organization, clear to the time Jesus comes, but not in the way we understand. Okay. Where does that come from? Okay, in Selected Messages, Volume 1. Well, I have the books with me. Why don't we just... <laughs> Let's see what we can find here. <laughs> and please, give me your questions. I may not be able to answer them all, but at least we can see what, they, what the questions are. <laughs> okay. On page 2, oh, 04, now I want to give you something you're familiar with and then we'll go into this. You remember that Ellen White had a vision of an iceberg and she said that she was on the ship. And the iceberg was headed for her, and she said, oh, we better do something. But then a voice came and said, no, meet it. You hit the iceberg. <laughs> now, that's not something captains usually try to do. But this captain was told, you hit it straight on and break it to pieces. Well, icebergs have some very interesting qualities to them. Only a little bit of them shows. <laughs> you drop it in the water and nine-tenths of it underneath and you don't know the shape. You can't see it. So you don't know what's really there. And it's cold. <laughs> These are two symbols of spiritualism. During her time, there was a spiritualistic movement philosophically entering the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Ellen White didn't know what it was. She knew there was something wrong, but she said, I didn't know what to call it. God called it something. He says it's free loveism. Free loveism? You mean like Frank Sinatra and all those? I did it my way? <laughs> yes. Free loveism. It was a form of pantheism that was coming into the church through John Harvey Kellogg. And he himself did not understand the issues. It was so sophisticated. She saw it, didn't know what it was for sure, but she knew there's something wrong here. And God showed her, meet it. Hit it straight on. Okay, now I'm, this is the context of this statement I'm going to read you, okay? Now I'll continue. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists. And that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Now, many people read this statement and they read it this way. There has been a supposition that we should have a reformation, but this is a great mistake. Well, the words are spelled exactly the same, aren't they? Reformation, reformation. <laughs> We've got to read it the way God meant us to understand it. He's not talking about reformation. We need that. <laughs> we must have it. But it's a reformation that is of the organizational system. God is the one who gives us an organization. It's the one in the Bible. 
It's not the one that men invent. Now, we've had an interesting history. I can't get into all of that with you. But you might want to look at the year 1901 in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Look it up carefully, historically, and see what happened. We reorganized. And the men that fought that reorganization were kind of an interesting group. The General Conference President, Daniels, fought it. In 1903, he said, it doesn't work, get rid of it. <laughs> And God told Alan White, this is what we need to do. And that's what we did in 1901. We did it right in 1901. We shifted gears in 1903 and got rid of it. And we have never gone back. We did something in those two years at a general conference session. And, Dan and Elder Daniels was right at the top of this saying it doesn't work. What comes from God doesn't work. <laughs> and it had to do with money. Interesting situation, isn't it? Do you know we're there again? The United States right now is in a precarious situation of thinking that we can run the world because we're where the money comes from. <laughs> there have been some very interesting statements put out in public over this in recent times. All right, so continuing the statement. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in His wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. And if you haven't heard that, I don't know where you've been. There are people out there today saying what the pioneers did was not the truth. They didn't understand because they were farmers. They were not theologians. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. Those farmers were talked to by God. <laughs> they knew things that go beyond brain power. <laughs> All right, so continuing. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. Books of a new order? We've got all kinds of books today. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. Is any of this sounding familiar? <laughs> the founders of this system, the, this new system that isn't from God, would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. What did God tell His people to do? He told us to go into the country and work the cities from the country. He didn't tell us to establish centers in the city. But she says here, in this system that is not from God, this new reformation, that's what they would do. They would go into the cities to do a wonderful work. And then it says, the Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded. Have you ever seen any place where it says it's okay to eat out on Sabbath and pay for it? Have you heard anything about the Sabbath that starts tearing it down as far as its sacredness? This part of the system. And then she finishes the sentence, as also the God who created it. In other words, he can't really tell you what to do in your life. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice. But God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Now here's the sentence that answers the question. Their foundation would be built on sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. <laughs> God has told us. That system, which is founded on an intellectual philosophy, 
which produces uh, books of a different order that says the pioneers really didn't have it together, that some of our past ideas were error. All these things, when they come together, she says, the leaders would say, oh yeah, virtue is better than vice. But it would be based on manpower, not God power. And she says, when it hits, the entire structure is going to be swept away. That's an interesting quote, don't you think? <laughs> it's been there all the time. Now, I believe the Seventh-day Adventist denomination belongs to God. I'm here today in this church because I believe this is God's church. <laughs> okay? There is no other. But we mustn't make the mistake that the church we see today is pleasing God. He has told us what He's going to do. And He will establish a new organizational system that we don't understand today among His true remnant people, the real ones who really keep the Sabbath, who have all the reform elements put together and they're living it in their lives. He will take His true church and do something on this earth that's never been done before. And so we have the opportunity sitting here today to make up our mind to be part of that real church and not put our emphasis on the system. Now I know that bothers some people when they discover that. <laughs> and we should be loyal to God's church. There's no question. We need to be loyal. But we need to see what that really is. <laughs> okay? Could this situation be like Gideon? He gathered all those men and the Lord told him he had too many because some of them wasn't true to the calling? Yeah, same thing. It was a simple test, wasn't it, they did? <laughs> yeah, just a little drink of water, that's all. How you took it. This is going to be another simple test when it comes around. God always does things in simple ways so it can't be confused. All right, so I'm glad that I could read that to you verbatim. You go study the entire context and see what it says there. These are things that we will have to think about more and more. The Scriptures will begin telling us. You know, it wasn't the way I thought the first time, time around. There's more to this. So, Daniel then is telling us some very important things here in the last chapter. By the way, I have to warn you that people have taken Daniel, the 12th chapter, to confuse the Seventh-day Adventist people more and more. Because most of us have not studied this chapter to see what it really says. And so there are people out there, most of them ex-ministers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who are telling the people that all of these numbers in here are in the future to be applied in a whole different way as the rest of the Bible. That's not good biblical hermeneutics. God uses numbers in certain ways and He repeats them so that you know what He meant. Daniel, the 12th chapter, is not literal numbers. It is prophetic numbers that go back to the way God used them the first time. Now, in Revelation, the 10th chapter, in your volume 7a, we're not there yet, so I just have to give it to you. Revelation, the, the 10th chapter, the comments there under, in 7a, she says very specifically that time ended. And then she says, prophetic time. Because we're still here. <laughs> she says, there are no time prophecies that reach past 1844. And I don't know about you, but that settles it for me. <laughs> when somebody gets on TV and starts telling me, oh, there's going to be 45 days of this, and there's going to be 60 days of this, and there's going to be... Come on, folks, where did you get the numbers from? From time prophecies that already ended in 1844. Be careful. All right. I think we can begin to appreciate here a little bit. We have just started into the book of Revelation and look where we've gone already. <laughs> the book of Revelation is for the last people on this earth. It tells us everything that's going on. I haven't told you anything that's not in the book of Revelation for the, in the last two weeks here. <laughs> we need to know this book. All right, so let's continue and let's see what else we begin to come up with here. In uh, Acts 3, which was a key 
Scripture to the early Adventists, they all preached on this one. Acts 3, verse 19 and following. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So this is not a new idea that was given to the Seventh-day Adventists. All the prophets had this message except for the time element. <laughs> okay? Every holy person in the Bible was an Adventist. Okay? We are not a minority. <laughs> we are the people of God, and the people of God have always been Adventists. And better than that, they've always been Seventh-day Adventists. Every one of them in the Holy Scriptures was a Sabbath keeper. <laughs> so don't think you've joined some brand new 1844 movement. Please don't go there. The Bible is clear. We are in the stream of God's people through all time since time began. We are here to bring back the real message of God. And so it says here, what's the first thing we need to do? Repent. Repent. And we need it. We have become just like the world. We must repent. We must decide what we're going to do about sin. Because God says He's going to blot it out. And as we mentioned before, He cannot blot it out of our records until He's blotted it out of our lives. If we keep doing it, how can he blot it out? <laughs> all right, so then it says, when he's going to do all of this, he doesn't blot out our sins when we ask forgiveness for them. We're not held accountable for anymore, but we, it's not gone, it's still there. It doesn't get blotted out until the times of refreshing. And that's just before Jesus comes. That's when the close of probation happens then God can get rid of all sin. It says, verse 21, until the times of restitution of all things. All right, so this is the... That inside with the time according to the sanctuary service when the high priest was carrying the sanctuary entirely on the day of the moment and place them on the state goat. Okay, that's a further step down the line. This time of refreshing is talking specifically about us and how He takes care of our sin problem. When He's taking care of it for the whole world, probation will, will close. That's the time of refreshing referred to here. The scapegoat is another issue. We, we might want to spend a time with that. Okay. Uh, I know the scapegoat follows this, but in order to have sins blotted out, blotted out, they have to be removed from the sanctuary, at least onto the person of the high priest again. Okay, there is another sequence in the sanctuary that we have to look at. God does everything in threes. Okay. And we've never studied that one out, but that's a tremendous thing to understand, how He does everything with threes. The first blotting out of sins is the people in the most holy place. Then there is a second blotting out of sin, which deals with the scapegoat, and that is the earth. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have the people, we have the sanctuary, and then we have the earth. Those are the three numbers. The sanctuary is the second step. The earth is the last one, and that doesn't happen till the end of the thousand years. 
So the scapegoat is an entirely study all by itself how God really does it. What we are concerned with is the blotting out of sin of our personal lives. What Satan is doing is different. Okay. You'll want to look at that. Someday all the churches are going to attack us on the point of the scapegoat. It's the only place they can go because the Bible is so clear on the Sabbath they can't do anything with it. But the scapegoat is something they can't get. So you need to be looking at that. That's a good thing to bring up at this point. We may deal a little bit more with it as we get into this. All right, so let's go back to Revelation 1. And we'll pick it up at uh, verse 7. This is the counterpoint of Daniel 12, which we have been talking about. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. So now we know that Daniel 12 tells us how. They're going to be raised to see it happen. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Nothing can change the scripture. This is going to happen just the way it says. Verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. From verses 9 to verses 20, we have now the introductory vision for the entire book. And this is a device that John uses. He says a few things, and then the rest of the book explains what he said. He did the same thing in, his, in the book of John. That first chapter does the same thing. All right. Jesus, then, is shown to be in the midst of his church in this section. He has never ceased to be in the midst of his church. Do you realize that one of the biggest controversies that we recently had in the Seventh Adventist Church starting in 19... about 78 was one of the doctors from our own schools who stood up and said Adventism's not true. After he'd been teaching it all the time. <laughs> he said it's not true. He said the investigative judgment is not in the Bible. And he had 58 reasons why it couldn't be in the Bible. <laughs> and he challenged the entire Seventh-day Adventist church to prove him wrong. When I found out this is what he was doing, I was utterly amazed that there were people who believed him. <laughs> I was absolutely shocked that a man could say such wild things and scholars said, that's right. And people started leaving the Adventist church because they said, they fooled us. I thought, isn't that strange? <laughs> but he said a lot of other things too. He said that Jesus cannot be on the earth because he's in heaven and because he's physical he's bound to one place so to say that Jesus is with you is not true now I don't know about you but when a man starts talking like that I say forget what he said I don't know where he's coming from but Jesus himself said lo I am with you always <laughs> And they say, oh yeah, but Ellen White said that in his humanity, he was bound to one place. Well, yeah, she said that. But on the same page, she says, by his spirit. <laughs> same, same page. <laughs> and I'm afraid we have not really understood that ourselves. Because people want to tell us it's the Holy Spirit, it's somebody else. No, my Bible says it's Jesus himself by his spirit. Did I take a jump with you there? <laughs> Go ahead. Revelation 22, 19 states that if you add or take away from this prophecy, that you be taken out. Mm -hmm. And 
sounds like what this fellow was doing. Not get reading the whole thing. <laughs> he wasn't the only one. As I began to research that and live through it and experience things and talk to people, and I talked to him too in front of 700 people, I found out why so many Adventists left with him. It's because they never understood Adventism in the first place. They didn't know what a real Adventist is supposed to know. Somebody just baptized them because they said, we believe. What do you believe? I believe I can still drink wine and be a faithful person of Christ. Oh, okay. Let's go baptize you. The Lord will take care of the wine later. Oh, but I still smoke. Don't worry. He'll take cigarettes away from you later. Get baptized. That is a horrible mistake. Isn't it interesting? We won't do that in Africa. Do you know that the missionaries take a person through a year of studies? And they have to answer all the questions right. And finally, at the end of all that process, they figure, okay, they really know what an Adventist is. We can baptize them. <laughs> you know we're making better Adventists over there than we are here? <laughs> yeah. It was them that voted against the ordaining of women at the General Conference before. They kept this church together. It was the United States who was pushing for it. Spirit of His Son, that's right. And that's who we have. We have Jesus Himself through His Spirit. Don't let somebody tell you, oh no, He can't because He's stepping on Ford's ground then. See? That's how the scholars do it. They say, no, it's got to be the Holy Spirit. Well, it is a Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit of Jesus. <laughs> okay? We're not discussing the third person of the Trinity, or the, no, I don't want to say Trinity, of the Godhead. We are discussing what Jesus does. <laughs> and if you say he can't do it, I don't know who the Jesus is you're talking about. Jesus is with me, himself. I don't need any other explanations. <laughs> All right. So, we have here... In Revelation, the introduction of Jesus saying He's in the midst of His church, and we'll talk about it more as we go into this. Jesus is in the midst of His church by His Spirit. He is a partner in everything the people of God do. Their affliction, their endurance, whatever they're going through, He's part of it with them. They are not doing it alone. They are not doing it for Him. They're doing it with Him. Okay. Second Corinthians thirteen eight. I've heard so many people get upset when somebody said something against the truth. Do you know that most of the reform movements are started by people who want to defend the truth? Yeah, they're out there. They're going to save the church from outside. But what did God say about truth? For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. You mean to say when that fellow comes in here ranting and raving, he comes all the way up here and he says, Alan White is not a prophet of God and I can prove it, and he writes a million scriptures for you. What has he done? Has he changed who Alan White is? <laughs> but what has he done? He really has done something for the truth. Because he raised some questions I never thought about before, and now I have to go home and I better find out. And when the Spirit deals with me and I find out, I've been fortified. That man helped me in the truth. <laughs> now that doesn't mean he was the truth. <laughs> Don't get confused. Just because a person forces you to study doesn't mean they're the truth. 
It may be error that forced you to do it. <laughs> but we cannot hurt the truth. Why is that? The truth is. Nothing can change it. <laughs> it just is. <laughs> it's a mathematical equation that cannot change. The truth is God. Jesus is the truth. And no matter what anybody says, no one's going to change him. So don't get excited about defending the truth. It doesn't need you. <laughs> it doesn't need me. <laughs> the truth is going to be there after we die. <laughs> and it'll be there for billions of years if we lose it. Don't defend the truth. Get the truth. Live in it, because it's going. And you better go where it goes. <laughs> so Jesus is in the midst of his church for a reason. He wants us to be in truth. The truth as it is. In Jesus is the way the scripture says it. So let's look now at the rest of verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother. So he's just like us. I'm your brother and companion in tribulation. You mean I'm not supposed to be out there celebrating all the time? You know, I have not found that in the Bible yet, where Christians go out to have a good time and feast and celebrate. I haven't found it. I don't know where people invented that one. I know what they did with the Bible. The word celebrate is used four times. Unfortunately, the King James Version is not correct in those four places. They knew what they were trying to say, but they messed up something. In all four places, it's a word play. Where it says, celebrate your Sabbath. The word for celebrate there is Shabbat. Sabbath, your Sabbath. And they didn't know how to say that in English, so they let it go. <laughs> and the other three times are exactly the same way. It's a word play. The word is repeated each time, and the word celebrate is not even there. All right. So it says here, Companion tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that's called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus. There it is. We're not out of the first chapter yet. The testimony of Jesus. The book of Revelation is the testimony of Jesus. How do we get it? Verses 1 and 2 says how we got it. It was signified through an angel, the angel of God, to John to give to the people. That's the sequence. An angel did the work of the Holy Spirit to John to give us the word of Jesus, his testimony. And so God uses mediums to give us his testimony. Ellen White was one of those. She was only a medium. She is not the testimony of Jesus. <laughs> She's just a person. All right. Now, if you're, you were paying attention to some of that, you realized that every now and then there would be a light in her room. <laughs> and she would talk to this being. Who was that? It was an angel. Do you know that the neighbors could see that light in her house? <laughs> I said, there's that light again. <laughs> yeah, she talked to angels. One time she was talking to Elder Daniels in the, the house at Elmshaven. That's before she stopped talking to him. <laughs> and uh, she stopped talking and she said, did you see that? He said, no. She says, oh, I thought you could see, see that. An angel just walked by at that moment and she saw the angel go by. <laughs> she said, did you see that? <laughs> Verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, before we go into the text itself, I want to remind you of something. In this verse, it says, He heard. In verse 12, what does it say? Uh, 
I turn to see. This is the way God does it. He says something to you, and then if you want to see it, you, you're going to have to turn around to see it. <laughs> That's what he does in Revelation 7. I heard the number of them. And after he was told all about it, then he looked to see them. <laughs> It's the same thing. It's what you would do. It's what I would do. You hear something and it's not in front of you, you turn to see. <laughs> so here we have a rule being established in chapter 1. All right. Now, the Sabbath. Why do I say the Sabbath? Nobody else says the Sabbath. They all say this is Sunday. <laughs> Where in that verse does it say it's Sunday? Don't ever back away from somebody saying, that's the Lord Day. Ask them. Oh, does your Bible say that? <laughs> and they say, well, it says the Lord's Day. Everybody knows it's the Lord's Day. I said, well, it must say that somewhere in the Bible then, doesn't it? <laughs> can you show me where it says that? And of course, for the next thousand years, I can look. It's not there. But the Bible does say it was the Sabbath. Yeah. Not in this verse. But guess what? right next to it on both sides, if you know what you're looking for. I'll give it to you in just a few moments. I want you to know first that John was praying on the Sabbath or we would never have gotten the book of Revelation. <laughs> yeah. If he'd been out doing his thing, it would not have happened. He was a Sabbath keeper. That's why we have the book of Revelation. He was praying on the Sabbath. He was not just sitting around sipping tea. He was having a religious experience with God on the Sabbath when Jesus came to him. How do I know that? Well, will you run through the Bible with me a little bit? Elijah. When did things happen in his life? <laughs> it was when he was praying. Every time he was praying. Cornelius, what was he doing when the angels came to him? Yes, yeah, Spirit Prophecy tells us he was praying. Peter, the other side of it, what was he doing? <laughs> yeah, he was even caught up in a vision through it all. <laughs> he was praying. Paul and Silas in prison, what were they doing? <laughs> Stephen. Yeah. They were throwing rocks at him. What was he doing? <laughs> yeah. And of course, Jesus is a supreme example. Pray. Angel came to him and brought him back from, he should have died, the last part there. Zechariah, yeah? You can think of all kinds of them. If you've been thinking about it, work your way through the Scriptures. John was praying on the Sabbath, and Alan White says exactly that. He was praying when Jesus came to him. Daniel. Mm -hmm. Daniel, yes. Yes. Now, there's a pattern here. It's a, it's a pattern of power. This is when God and the person are close, and Jesus says, Okay, I want to do something here with you. You're in tune. You're ready to hear it. So there's something very powerful about this verse. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say that John, when he died, he was die he died in a praying position, and that he had calluses on his knees from, from all the praying that he had been doing. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I wouldn't doubt that one bit. There are a lot of interesting things about John. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll stay here. <laughs> all right, so... What we have happening in verse 10, let's look at Isaiah 58. It's a familiar territory to us. Verse 13. 
If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And then there's a blessing that follows that. But notice, this is not saying that if you enjoy something, you can't do it. That's not what the Scripture's saying. <laughs> People get all hung up. They become legalists, and they just want to do what the words say instead of understanding what the thought is. The thought here is about salvation, true salvation. There's only one kind in the Bible. It is God-dependence. This is telling us to, not, to give up self-dependence. The Sabbath will be something we really enter into when our self-dependence has been set aside and we depend upon God only. Because then we will know we are His creatures doing creaturely responsibilities. We are dependent upon Him. John was in prayer. Now, uh, we also can think of it in this way. As we go through the Sabbath hour, we be in the attitude of prayer in all that we do, say, and think. This is real prayer. Yeah, yeah. And of course, this is... Uh, a uh, good thing for us all to understand about prayer. We've read that we, we should constantly be in the attitude of prayer. Some people get the weird idea that they're supposed to be on their knees. Well, you can't be on your knees when you're driving a car, but you can still be praying. <laughs> We've, we must constantly have our minds open and tuned in so that we have a channel there with God. There, there should never be a time when we can say, I don't want to think about God. I don't want to know about Him. I don't want to hear from Him. Years ago, I was down financially, so I didn't have a radio in my car. And that's surprising how your mind will clear up if that thing is not turned on. <laughs> that's right. It's true about lots of things. Okay, so the Sabbath then has something to say to us right here in this verse. And we're too busy fighting people about Sunday to get into the real thing here. There is a Sabbath blessing in this verse, a very powerful one. The trumpet. How come it says trumpet? He heard a, he heard a trumpet. He didn't hear Jesus talking. <laughs> yeah, it says he heard a trumpet. And that trumpet told him, there's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come. If we heard a trumpet, what would we think? <laughs> That's a trumpet. <laughs> but to a Hebrew, trumpets are very important. Okay? Nothing happened without trumpets. And a Hebrew mind would instantly click. First thing they knew about on Mount Sinai. The sound of the trumpet blasting and getting louder and louder and louder. And it drove them to their knees. I said, uh-oh, that means God is here. Those trumpets blowing, Mount Sinai. Trumpets were always there for the Jubilee. The trumpets were always there for eight days before the atonement, the shofar. And we're told, of course, that Jesus, there'll be a silver trumpet blowing when he comes, and that trumpet will wake the dead. <laughs> So the trumpet meant something, and John knew all that. When he heard that trumpet, he said, uh-oh. <laughs> That's why he turned around to look. That trumpet came and said something to him. All right, before we get into that, I would like to give you something. In verse 5 of Revelation, <laughs> okay, verse 5 is a quote from Isaiah 55, verse 4. It's just a partial quote. But if you didn't know that, you would just let it go by. Now, I want you to see something that John did here. In verse 7, 
We have a quote from Daniel 7, 13. The first part. Then the second part of verse 7 has a quote from Ze Zechariah 2, 12, 10. In verse 8, there is a quote from Isaiah 41. Isaiah 44, 6. And 48, 12. Now, so far, this doesn't mean anything to you, but now I'm going to finish the quotes after verse 10. <laughs> okay? The quotes after verse 10. Okay, I'm going to put 10 here. After verse 10. is the rest of those quotes. Now you'll notice what happened here. Isaiah 41, Isaiah 41, 44.6, 44, 6, 44, 6, 44. He has repeated something here. <laughs> he did it on purpose. Okay, verse 12. Zechariah 4, verse 2. Verses 13 through 15, he makes an extensive quote from Daniel 7, 9, 13, and 22. And then chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. It's more of an illusion there. And in verse 16 is a quote from Isaiah 49, verse 2. Okay, now I had to write this because there's no way you could see what's happening unless I did it. <laughs> Now remember that all of these quotes are right around verse 10. But you'll notice what they do. The last quote is from Isaiah. The first quote is from Isaiah. The next quote is from Daniel. And Daniel. The next quote is from Zechariah. And Zechariah. And the middle quote is exactly the same quote. <laughs> So he has done something to cause your mind to do this. <laughs> He's telling you something about verse 10. <laughs> and so once you dig into all of these scriptures of what he's done, these scriptures talk about God. And he's talking about God from the point of view of his creative power. Verse 10 is about Jesus, the Creator. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the Creator's Day, the Sabbath. It's one of the most powerful things that I can see in the book of Revelation to show that the Lord's Day is the Sabbath, not Sunday. <laughs> These scriptures are designed to bring us to understand who Jesus is. In theology, they have a technical term for this. It's called an empinado. They know about these devices, and John used it around verse 10. It's one thing for us to know it was on the Sabbath. Ellen White says it was the Sabbath, point blank. But we need more than that. We need the Bible, because that's where she got it from. <laughs> Do 
Jesus says, verse 11, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. It's an interesting thing that we got that in the Greek. This was written in the Greek language. This was not translated around. It was given in the Greek. Alpha and Omega, the first letter and the last letter, the beginning and the end, everything in between. Jesus is at both ends. That doesn't mean, of course, that He had an actual beginning. He's just saying that any place you can go that way or that way, there He is. <laughs> okay. So, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. Now, we talked about this before, that Ellen White was not given a lot of verbal information. She saw pictures. She saw things in vision. And she had to do research to find out where it fit in history. She was not given dates for these things. She had to discover those things through hard work. She did lots of reading. She and her husband both did lots of reading. And they would find things that said, Look, here's what I saw. <laughs> And sometimes the wording was so good, she just said, we'll just take those words. They said good. <laughs> and of course, people today might get upset and say, well, that's plagiarism. But they didn't have those problems back in that day. People did it all the time. Okay? And she, in great controversy, says why she did it that way. She says, I didn't do this to quote these people as authorities. They just had really good language and I used it. <laughs> My authority comes from a different place. <laughs> Okay, so these little clues are hiding in the book of Revelation if we want to look at them and see them. All right, what thou seest, <clears throat> signified, uh-huh. Put in sign, that's right. That's the symbol, uh, symbolism. Oh, you didn't say it? Oh, it says uh, signified by an angel. The word signify means to put in sign form. And we went through that in, in the first few verses there. It's, that's why God showed John these things in cartoon forms. And then John had to write it down. So it says here, What thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And we'll get into those later, and we won't spend any time with that right now. In verse 12 it says, He turned to see. He turned to see. And you know what He saw? He saw candlesticks. Seven of them. These number sevens just keep coming. They keep rolling at us. Seven, 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 seven. But then it says what he looked at. He wasn't looking at the candlesticks. Verse 13. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So there it is. That's where John put his focus. The Son of Man, Jesus. So he turned from everything else. He turned from the information. He turned from everything so he could look at Jesus, the portrayer of all these things. That's a trick many of us have not learned yet. We're big in information and we forget where it's coming from. <laughs> yeah, we want to know all about last day events, but not so much about knowing how we're going to get through them with Him. We know all kinds of technical things, but what about Him? This is what this is all about. John did the right thing. Him! <laughs> And so when he looked, he did something that's not really explained here, but we can go back to Daniel 10 and see it. If we don't want find something in Revelation, we'll find it back there in Daniel. <laughs> in Daniel, the 10th chapter. Verse 5. I lifted up my eyes and looked. Oh, he does the same thing. <laughs> Has somebody been talking to him? And then he looked. He said, I, I lifted up my eyes and I looked. And behold, 
a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, and his face is the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire. Who do you suppose this is? <laughs> His arms and his feet like the color of polished brass. The voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude. The same description that John has saw. Same person. This voice, like many waters, it was like a choir talking. So when Jesus talks, it's all his church talking. <laughs> all those voices. Verse 7. And I, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men that were with me. He saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them. They fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone, and I saw this great vision. There remained no strength in me. There it is. No strength in him. That's one of the signs of a genuine prophecy coming to this person through Jesus Christ. The strength left him. Weak. Ellen White had this happen to her every time. As soon as something started to happen, she would say, Glory! 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 <laughs> she was gone! <laughs> and then her strength is gone. <laughs> and she stopped breathing. No more breathing. The longest time was over four hours with no breath. No brain damage either. <laughs> no breath. One time a doctor was there who was not a Seventh-day Adventist. He said, this is fake. You people really are something. He even has somebody pretending like they're not breathing. They said, go ahead. <laughs> You're a doctor. <laughs> so he got up there with his little match. Nothing. <laughs> he got up there with his mirror. <laughs> Nothing. He tested her. <laughs> Nothing. That scared him. He said, let me out of here. <laughs> they said, no, 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 no. You stay right here. <laughs> You're going to stay for the whole thing. You sign a paper saying what you saw. <laughs> no, it's right here in Daniel 10. And this is what is happening in Revelation. John is weak. Continuing. My strength in me, my comeliness was turned into me unto corruption. I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. Okay, he's gone from this world. He said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee. Who's talking to him? The only other person from heaven that talks to humans. Jesus and, Dan and Gabriel. It's never another angel. It's always Gabriel. All right. You are a man greatly beloved. Understand the words that I speak unto thee. Stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken his word unto me, I stood trembling. So now he's standing again, but he's shaking. <laughs> then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So he was doing it. He was praying. He was being totally God-dependent. It's always there. All right, I'm not going to read anymore. It says he became dumb. And, uh, but in Revelation, this is what's happening. So John fell to the ground. And then it says, I saw in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt upon the paps of the golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white as wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, his feet like unto fine brass as they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth at his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. <laughs> Surely that would be a good reaction. <laughs> See something like that standing in front of you. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, but I want to back up a moment. You made a statement, I believe, that only Christ or Gabriel can speak to us. Does that eliminate my guardian angel? Speaking to me, personally. 
<laughs> no, what I meant to say was that messages coming specifically from God are from Gabriel and from Jesus. Okay, that's better. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> All right. No, certainly, we should be glad that we have our angels. By the way, I have a theory. I can't prove it, but I have a theory that we must have about three angels. And some of us might need more. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know some of the angels must have ragged, tattered robes the way some people get themselves in trouble all the time. But, uh, yeah, certainly our angels can whisper to us. They need to help us and guide us in that direction. Thank you. That clears that up. <laughs> all right. So let's look at some of this here in uh, the description. By the way, there are seven descriptions. <laughs> Anytime something's happening, there's going to be a seven in it somewhere. <laughs> We have seven descriptions here. We have a description of his head. He's got white hair. Now, I don't know if he's going to look just like we visualize when he comes back, but the Bible pictures him as having white hair, which is a symbol. I don't think Jesus is old, the way we think of old people. <laughs> I think he's young. Eternally young. Eternally at the optimum of whatever optimum can be. <laughs> <laughs> but for the sake of talking to us, he has pictured himself here as having white hair. Why? Purity. Because when we get white hair, we're supposed to have some smarts too. <laughs> it doesn't always happen. <laughs> but supposedly when you get white hair, you're supposed to be smarter than when you didn't have white hair. <laughs> okay, so we're talking here about age and wisdom, character. <laughs> <laughs> no, lose it. <laughs> All of it. Well, you keep them guessing that way. <laughs> All right. So the first thing we have here is infinite wisdom. And we, all of us will say, oh yeah, God has infinite wisdom. Really? Does he have infinite wisdom? Are you sure? Then why don't we let him do what he wants with our lives? <laughs> because we think we're smarter, that's why. <laughs> Isn't it strange that we can understand things theologically, but somehow in the life it kind of disappears? <laughs> I uh, somehow this last month got stuck in the book of Deuteronomy, and Moses was telling the children of Israel, if I have this correctly, the reason that God had them wander in the wilderness was so that they could understand themselves. And it seems to me that I have this same problem in that I honestly, I'm on my knees and feel like I have surrendered everything to God only to find some other hideous thing inside of me a short time thereafter. And is it not that, that we're like peeling leaves of an onion or, you know, to, to get to the core of us? Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, we're all in the same boat. When we think we know something, then God shows us, well, you didn't get it yet. Let's go around this again. <laughs> and we have to keep doing it and doing it. Until it gets tighter and tighter. You know, the interesting thing is, instead of feeling better about yourself, the other thing happens. You begin seeing more and more. You know, I'm not as good as I thought I was. <laughs> if we come to the place where we feel that we're getting better and better, we're in a dangerous condition. As John the Baptist, he felt he must decrease continuously. The more the closer we come to Christ, the more we'll see our defects and rely upon him. Good, good. That's right. Okay, let's let's try to see what John. You're John now, okay? And this has hit you. <laughs> You've heard the voice, and you're looking. And here's this dazzling. It's not just white. It's dazzling white. It's glistening at you. The eyes. You take a moment quickly to look at the eyes. They're flashing like there's fire inside there. <laughs> and you know what that means. No secrets. 
<laughs> you look into those eyes and they say, I know everything. <laughs> Don't pretend. <laughs> Don't even think it. It's everything. Maybe we ought to try one. Job 34, 21. Verse 21, For his eyes are upon the ways of men, and he seeth all his goings. There is no darkness, nor shadow of death, where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. So Job learned this a long, long time ago, and no one is ever going to find out anything different about God. This is the truth, and it's forever. There's nothing anyone can ever do where they think they're hiding. There's no such thing as hiding from God. He's out there watching. He sees it all, and he knows what it means. <laughs> we can't pretend, oh, but I was doing it for this reason. He says, well, okay, you can say it, but I know what your real reason was. I'm inside of you. <laughs> I know the real reason. What does verse Okay, we must remember that this is an argument here. And Elihu, let's see. Job has said, uh, yeah, this is Elihu here talking to him. And he is introducing another side of it to prove that Job is wrong, that God is doing something to him before a reason. So remember the context. This is not a, a truth the way it comes out. He's trying to make it a truth. Now, there is a truth hiding in it. And that is that we will reap what we sow. But he was trying to lay things on Job that Job didn't think he did. <laughs> okay, so anyhow, there's, there's more to that scripture, but we'll leave that right there. Now, uh, in Hebrews 4.13... Verse 12, it says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So don't worry about God knowing what you meant. He knows. <laughs> and then it says, verse 13, Neither is there any creation, creation that is not manifest in His sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Now that should be comforting to us. He knows everything. That means that when somebody cuts you down and sees you wrong, He knows the real of it. It doesn't matter. He knows. And that's all going to stand in the judgment. All right, what about His feet? The feet were... Glowing, hot, glowing. They showed an irresistible strength and power. They're designed to break things. And of course, the devil knows this. In Revelation uh, 10 and following, Jesus takes an active part on what's going on in this earth in a very personal way for the whole planet. It says one foot's on the land and one foot is on the sea. Well, that's all there is on this planet. It's the whole planet. He has come and He's put His feet down there. That means He's going to finish His work in an irresistible way. It's going to get done. This is what John is starting to see, the power of those feet. It has to do with the third angel's message, those feet. All right, going on. The voice. He heard this choir. <laughs> Beautiful choir talking. And Jesus, of course, is the church, the real church. We're, we are not the church. We, we join the church. He's the church. He's the head and we are the body. And now the body's talking, and that's what John was hearing. This multitude, this beautiful sound, the salvation of the redeemed. He heard the redeemed sound. 
It's not just the way Jesus talks. There's a symbol here. All right, so he ha had a right hand, and of course the right hand is connected to the head. But what's in the hand? Said his ministers. Oh, you have something? I think so, if you want to say it that way. All right, so he had in his hand ministers. Now, there's a double application to this scripture. Since God is organized, he was also dealing here with those leaders of the church that have been ordained to do that specific work. That is their work. We know that everyone who's a Christian is a minister. Okay? Okay? And they've been ordained by God to be soul winners, every Christian. But God still has leaders. And he's saying in a very specific way, he has those leaders in his right hand. Now, I count it a very dangerous thing for some people to get out there and start calling leaders names and saying they're not fit to be leaders and this and that. They're apostates and so forth. And there are people out there doing that kind of thing. That's kind of dangerous in my eyes because Jesus has them in his right hand. And whatever's going to happen, he's going to decide it. I don't think anybody ought to think they can take somebody out of Jesus' hands and do something themselves. So it says here they're in his right hand, and that is a position of honor. They don't deserve it, obviously, but they are in that place of honor, and it is a place of safety. No one can yank somebody out of Jesus' hands. It's not possible. They can do it but themselves, but he will not allow anybody else to do that. He is their possessor and their protector. And loyalty in this place is the safest place there can ever be. We'll come back to some of these things. In his mouth is his word. It does two things. It has two sides to it. It cuts this way and that way. It converts and it condemns. If it will not soften, it will harden. But it's going to do something. It will not come there and do nothing. There's no such thing as neutrality in God's universe. We're either with Him or we're not with Him. And so everything He does is a dividing line. It's penetrating. His face was as the sun shining. It was a terrible brightness. And who dare gaze into that face in all of its power? Even when he comes and the redeemed, the living saints, look up at him, their first thought will be one of complete fear. They're not going to stand up and say, Oh, wonderful, I'm going home now. <laughs> They're going to look up and say, Who is able to stand? And their faces will all gather paleness. But of course, Jesus will say some words as he goes around, and that will change everything. And then they'll be able to say, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for him, and he will say, Yes, yes. But that's not the first reaction. <laughs> okay. So we have here a sevenfold description, which we will meet again as we study the book of Revelation. But we need to know that this is what John saw in that first moment. He falls prostrate in total submission. And he leaves himself in the hands of the one who upholds all things. He knows that he is in the place of honor, undeserving as he or anyone else is. The living one has come. Notice what Jesus says. When I saw him, I fell at his feet dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now remember, you're John, and this being, who the last time he saw him, he had put his head on his chest. <laughs> he knows it's the same person. And this being puts his hand on his shoulder. He said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. 
Behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Who has the keys? That's not what you're going to be hearing in the newspapers. You're going to be hearing the Pope has the keys. He says so. <laughs> he has the keys of Peter. Now Jesus says, I have the keys. And no one took them away from him. He has the keys. What is the key to life and death? He broke the power of death. That's something we don't get today. We don't seem to understand it. He really broke the power of death. And the way he broke it was to go down into it and say, do everything you can do to me. And when death had done everything it could do, he walked out of there <laughs> and said, it wasn't enough. You aren't that strong after all. I've destroyed you forever as a power. And the devil knew he was had because that's the only power he has is death. And Jesus broke it. But he didn't need it for himself. So he gave it to me. He gave it to you. The power of death has been broken. And so death is not something a Christian is afraid of. It's been broken. If we go to sleep for a while, so what? <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. That's not death eternally. So he says, I have the keys. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be. The mystery of the seven stars. What's a mystery in the Bible? Okay. A mystery is something that's not obvious to the understanding. So don't think you're getting it the first time around. It's not an obvious thing to reason. We can get some of it that way, but we will not understand the mystery. The mystery is hidden from natural man. It will be made plain to the godly. That's why the book of Revelation is for his servants. Nobody else will understand this book. So the mystery is something you need to get into by initiation. By receiving Jesus, he will now reveal the mysteries to you. You know the secret handshake. <laughs> you are one with God. All right, so he says, this mystery, I'm going to explain it to you. The seven stars and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. <laughs> so we don't need to guess about that. He just flat tells us what it means. We have a symbol here in verse 20 of something that's going on in the, the Sunday-keeping world. In the Sunday-keeping world, an invention of recent time goes something like this. All you have to do is believe. You believe in Jesus and nothing, nothing can change, change your salvation. You are eternally saved. And so because of that, you don't need to be concerned about obedience. It's better if you obey. It would look nice if you obeyed. It would honor God if you obeyed. It would all of this, but it doesn't matter. You are saved. Now, because that crept into the Sunday keeping church, they had to come up with some other things. When Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and not do the things I say? They say, well, that scripture really doesn't apply to your salvation. That applies to something else. <laughs> and they have an entire theology built around this idea that Jesus is not the Lord of a Christian. And so, it's almost futile to try to talk to some of these people if you don't know the background of their thinking. They've been told you don't need to obey to be saved. Now, there's a truth in it, but not the what that they believe. <laughs> they have taken justification by faith and made it everything that the Bible ever says, and that's not the whole story. 
Justification by faith is through the merits of Jesus alone, but it does something, and that's the part they don't get. There's a man by the name of John MacArthur who is fighting the Sunday keeping bunch that teach that. He's written two books now on the Lordship of Jesus. And he says it correctly. Justification is through faith alone. But it's not real justification if you don't get the works. He's got it done correctly. A Sunday keeper. I don't know what he's going to do with the Sabbath when that hits him between the eyes, but for right now he's saying the right things. And he is really pushing hard. And they're fighting him. But he's doing something none of us are able to do over there right now. He's getting to think about obedience as something that comes in the Christian life. And if the Sunday keepers are starting to have it pushed on them, it seems like we ought to get it on us somewhere. <laughs> so verse 20 is about lordship. Right there in the book of Revelation. We cannot give that away. In verse 11 it says the church. I'm trying to bring this together now because we're going to have to close this chapter today. The church in Acts of the Apostles page 11, which is actually the first page of the book, I think. It says the church was organized for service. That is a very important sentence. The church was organized for service. We can't ever turn that sentence into any other arrangement. Who is the church? Is it the organization? Not according to that sentence. It says the church, which already exists, is organized. There's the organization. <laughs> the organization comes after the church. The organization is not the church. That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. That the organization is the church. And you have to join it to become part of the church. That is Roman Catholicism. If we're going to stay in the Bible, we've got to understand these things just the way they... Even though it might upset some people at first. We are never talking against organization. <laughs> we must be organized. Otherwise, there's no service. <laughs> We must be organized for service. <laughs> but it's the church that's organized. The believers. They become an organization to do service. Very important sentence. So the church organized for service then is what Jesus is addressing. He is not addressing individual members. That's the mistake that some of the independents are making. They think that if you are a believer in Jesus, you are the church, so Jesus talks to you directly and you don't need an organization. That is not true. God works through organization. So there are two ways to jump off of a bridge. <laughs> it doesn't matter which side. If you're off the bridge, you're off the bridge. <laughs> All right, so let's look at this. Number one, and I'm going to give you seven now. Do you wonder why it's seven? <laughs> I'm going to give you seven. The church is addressed as we go through here. Okay. <laughs> That's number one. The church is addressed. Jesus is going to talk to each of the different churches. Number two will be given the identity of the writer. And it will be one of those seven descriptions of Jesus we have already seen. Those seven descriptions say something very particular to the church he's talking to, and they know what he means. Number three will be a description of the spiritual condition of that church. Number four will be things to be reproved in that church. Number five will be a call to repentance in a very particular way. And to every church he will say the same thing, Hear the Spirit. And number seven, there will be a promised reward to the overcomer. Now you mentioned a little while ago the keys, the keys of death. Did I understand you right? 
Now, when he gave the keys to the disciples, the keys of the kingdom, but this was the keys of a key turns on. A key, a key reveals truth. Now, what you just said in these seven points reveal the keys that we must be governed by. Am I correct? You made the statement that the keys... Slow down, brother. Slow down. <laughs> Seven points reveals the keys that we must be governed by, right? Now, I lost you right after that. See, uh, uh, if I, may, I may have misunderstood him. I, I thought he said the keys that were given and the Roman Catholic Church uh, counterfeits it. The keys... Given to the disciples and we, as we uh, we let ourselves be led by the Spirit, are the keys that open up truth, the keys to truth, not to the keys to death. And the seven uh, uh, quotations you just made open up all these keys of understanding. What you just said, am I correct? Okay, let me try to clarify based on what I've seen here. Uh, I can say yes to all of it. There's one element here. Keys. What time is it? We don't have time today. Next time, we will get into the first church specifically, and then I'll outline what it is he's saying to that church. But one of the elements is this, and it bears on this question, that he will be talking to us as individuals also. And so the keys, first of all, bear on faith and opening up to truth. Amen. Okay. Now, if we have the genuine faith, we will never, they can never bend those keys to us to unlock death that isn't part of their real faith. So it still is death and the grave. Those keys constitute everything. Jesus, I'm alive, I have it to give. But only to those who have genuine faith do they get out of that situation. So it's a bigger thing. It does involve all of it. What the Pope has done is this. It's very clever. He has changed the attention to the keys rather than to the faith that those keys represent. That's the part. And we need to understand that the keys that the church have we all have those keys here if we are the real church. Are to open up salvation. And death cannot hold a person in salvation. Faith is the key in the hand of... Yes. In the hand that opens. So, so death is a result of not having access to these keys. Okay. <laughs> all right. Good. That's right. So all these things need to be held together, but they need some of them to be looked at from different sides. That's the difficulty here. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we have seven things here that we will notice as we go through the churches, and we'll start next time. But before we do that, I want you to notice that Smyrna, the second church, and Philadelphia, the sixth church, there are no reproofs. The first church paid the full price. They died. They went all the way. Okay, Philadelphia, which is number six. Philadelphia is brotherly love. Now, I'm going to stop. I'm going to give you a little bit on that. I should give you the other thing. You need to know this. Sardis and Laodicea, I have no praise. <laughs> God has nothing good to say to Laodicea. Nothing. There are people in our midst who claim to be teachers who say that there are hot, cold, and lukewarm Laodiceans. Well, if there were hot ones, Jesus would find some praise for them. I'm sorry. There's no such thing as a hot Laodicean. That's not in the Bible. So, if that's not in the Bible, what in the world does a Laodicean become when they're no longer a Laodicean? A Philadelphian. 
Do you see how simple that is? If you can't turn into a hot one, you've got to turn into something else. Well, the only one that Jesus had no reproof for is the Philadelphian, the one that is the sixth church. When we get there, we'll spend the time to show why. The entire church, Philadelphia, is about Seventh-day Adventists. No Laodicean is going to heaven, ever. Only Philadelphians are going to go. So we have to get out of Laodicea, if we're there, and into Philadelphia. We need to know what God's church looks like. It does not look like a Laodicean. So if you were told that the Seventh-day Adventist church is Laodicea, you better start getting that one out of your head. It's not true. Not the real Seventh-day Adventist church. There may be people in Laodicea who are part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but they are not the Church of God. So again, there is a false theology that has been foisted upon us by well-meaning people. One error leads to this error, to this error, to this error, and all these errors hang together and they say all of these same things. But once you get into the truth, the truth will not support that error, and the truth here will not support that error, and the truth will not... And all of a sudden you begin seeing a whole line of things, and we began this session with one of the most important ones. Jesus is not just like us. He is like us in a sense. He was a, hu a true human. But He wasn't the kind of human that I am wanting to sin all the time. As a natural person, He never experienced that. He never had that. So he wasn't like me when I was a natural person. Well, if he wasn't like me like a natural person, I have to assume he wasn't like you as a natural person either. As a matter of fact, I've never found a person he was like <laughs> as a natural human. That was the first error. Now, if we can get past that to see who he really was and what he came to show, how a Christian lives, and how it's done. Now we can understand the born-again experience and what it delivers. And from there we can begin seeing things. And we begin seeing that God is not an elitist. He's humble. And so He's not going to make an elite group. Why should He? He's not like that. So what we were taught about the 144,000 can't be right, that there's this elite group of priests who teach everybody else in eternity. They get to go with Jesus and nobody else does. You know, there's just something wrong with a whole bunch of things like that. We've got to let that go and say, what does the Bible really say? Yes, it says 144,000 follow the Lamb with us wherever He goeth, but who is that? It's anybody who wants to be with Him among the redeemed. We'll get more into these things as we go along. What I'm saying here, there is a system of truth in the Bible that holds, and no matter how you try to punch it, it won't go away. It keeps saying that one thing. But there are lots of other things. By the way, did any of you read Great Controversy 656 this week? <laughs> I think I want to read the page to you since you didn't read it. Because it's one of the most misunderstood concepts in Adventism today. Oh, are you looking for something else? <laughs> okay, Great Controversy 656. I need to give you a little of the context. You need to go home and check these things. The chapter is entitled, The Desolation of the Earth. On page 654 it says, When the voice of God turns the captivity of His people, there is a ter terrible awakening of those who have lost all in the great conflict of life. While probation continued, they were blinded by Satan's deceptions and they justified their course of sin. The rich, and then she goes through talking about all the different. The wicked are filled with regret, not because of their sinful neglect of God and their fellow men, but because God has conquered. Now, what is the context? Just with a little few words I've said here. Probation what? Has closed. For who? For the church? It says the wicked. That means everybody. Probation is closed. That is the context of what we will be reading here. Probation is closed for the world. Probation closes for the church before 
closes for the public. Okay, that's what we're trying to understand here. Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, is the issue. There are those who have been saying that Ellen White says Ezekiel 9 is the judging of the Seventh-day Adventist Church because it says begin at the sanctuary. Let's see if that's true or not. By that they mean the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let's see. So far we have probation closing for the wicked. The whole world is when it's closed here. In, on page 655 at the bottom it says, The people see... They have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Oh, begin at the ancient men. That's what it says in Ezekiel 9. The ministers. Begin with the ministers, God says. It says, Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now in their despair these teachers confess before the world, not before the Seventh-day Adventist Church, before the world, their work of deception. The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry. You are the cause of our ruin. Well, who is it in the world who's telling people not to keep the Sabbath? Billy Graham? Jerry Falwell? Used to be Jerry Baker? I mean, I can think of lots of people who've been doing this. I fit right in this verse. They're not Seventh day Adventists. This verse is not about, I mean, this uh, sentence is not about Seventh day Adventists. This is about the world. Continuing. A noise, this is a quote from Jeremiah. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with some of the Adventists, the nations. That's what it says. The nations. He will plead with all flesh. Not some of the Adventists. All flesh. The whole world. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. For 6,000 years the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and His heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. Now all have made their decisions. Same context, the whole world, everybody. Everybody's made the decision. That means probation is closed for everybody, the whole world. Continuing. The wicked have fully united with Satan in his warfare against God. The time has come for God to vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law. Now, the controversy is not alone with Satan, but with men. The Lord had a controversy with the nations. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. The mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done. Now, get the word, now the angel of death goes forth represented in Ezekiel's vision by the men with the slaughtering weapons. To them the command is given, slay utterly old and young, both maids, little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. Probation is closed for who? The whole world. The people who fought against the law of God are called the ancient men, the ministers. And where does God say Ezekiel 9 must now begin? With the ministers of the Sunday-keeping churches who taught people to break God's law. Now it says begin in my sanctuary. This is the problem. Why Seventh-day Adventists have misunderstood Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel 9 never was about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, ever. It's been a misapplication. Now, it is true there are Seventh-day Adventist ministers who will come under this, yes, because there are some of those who are unfaithful too. But this is not a prophecy about the Adventist Church. What is the sanctuary? In ancient Israel, when a person came, and they had their little animal signifying the innocence of Jesus. 
and their sin was transferred where I was transferred. To the sanctuary. The sanctuary had to be cleansed from their sin. That was a symbol. The sins really didn't go there. Where did they really go? To heaven. Yes, every sin you have ever confessed and had forgiven by Christ is in heaven registered there. Your sins and my sins are polluting heaven. I want to apologize for talking so much, but you know the angel uh, 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 in the writer's inkhorn in Daniel 9, he, is he not sealing also those that will be faithful? And so what is uh, what would this do? It would be preparing those that will give the loud cry the latter rain experience. Am I wrong? Besides of what you have said, I agree with what you said there. But, uh, you no, the seal, the seal, the seal prepares them for that. But that does not have any, that doesn't deal with Ezekiel nine, the judgment. Let's see what happens. We need one place here. Page four, four eighty. Here's what she says. Attended by heavenly angels, our great high priest enters the Holy of Holies and there appears in the presence of God to engage in the last acts of His ministrations on behalf of man to perform the work of investigative judgment and to make atonement for all who are shown to be entitled to its benefits. Who is the all? Adam. <laughs> no. Moses. Everybody in the human race. The atonement in the sanctuary is for the human race, not Seventh-day Adventists. Down here on the same page, it says, In the great day of final atonement and investigative judgment, the only cases considered are those of the professed people of God. So Luther has a case in the investigative judgment. Calvin has a case. Savonarola has a case. The Pope has a case. <laughs> yeah, he professes to serve Jesus Christ. Every human on this earth who has ever professed to believe Jesus or God through the ministry of Jesus, their case is in the sanctuary. And so when God says, begin in my sanctuary, he means begin at the people who are alive on earth who have professed to be Christians. That's every Sunday keeper and every Seventh-day Adventist also. But it does not divide them into two groups. It's everybody who has professed to believe in Jesus. God has not made a division between Adventists and Sunday keepers. That is an elitist idea that we have been taught as a people. No, God treats people as people in the relationship to Jesus Christ, period. Now, there's another quote I need here. Um, on page 483, as the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come to review before God. That does not say Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> all. Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth. An advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. Every name is mentioned, every case closely investigated. So, in Ezekiel 9, when it says, Begin in my sanctuary, what is God saying? We've got to close the sanctuary service. We've got to begin the investigative judgment with the first ones who ever lived. We've got to go all the way through until the last person who is alive closes our probation. And then when the judgment begins, which is after probation closes for the human race, then Ezekiel 9 applies. It does not apply to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
It applies to the whole human race alive at that time. So, let's deal with the second question here. Is the Seventh-day Adventist church judged first and then another church judged second? That's what we've been taught by certain people. I want to graph it for you. This is very important. First one to be judged, okay? Adam. He's the first one whose case went into the sanctuary. We get down here. Probation closes. Right there. For the whole human race. The sanctuary is going on, doing its work. It will go to the living. So you are saying that in this there are two groups. Two groups. There are one group of people who have asked for forgiveness. Yeah, that's, that's what I want to ask, where we can put the second group, if there's another group. We're going to try to put them inside or someplace. But the other group is a group, let's say it's some heathen who never heard and never wanted to ask forgiveness. They, in their heart, okay. they would not be in the sanctuary. Okay, let's, let's clear that one up too. There are two groups of humans on planet Earth. The redeemed and the lost. Those in Jesus, those who are not. That's the only two groups of people there are on this planet. There's nobody else. There's nobody in between trying to decide. You're either here or you're here. <laughs> okay. So when Jesus comes, there will be a group of people who are redeemed. And there will be a group of people who are lost. Nobody else. So what we're trying to figure out here is this teaching that's come into our midst that says the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to be judged first. They will constitute the 144,000 and now there will be another group over here and when Jesus comes there will be two groups of people waiting for Him to come. Let's see if we can find that any place. Alright, so we have Adam here and all the rest of the human race. Now, 1844... The investigative judgment begins. And we have some Adventists dying faithfully. And then over here, we have a special resurrection for them. Now they're all alive. These people are alive. They're living saints. They join the people who never died. Okay? Now these people and these people, do they make two groups or one group? One group. Good. So, we have all the Adventists who are alive now during this period of time here. They're all alive waiting for Jesus to come. Now, the human race also lives during this period. And when you become a Seventh-day Adventist, you become one of these. Now, let's get over here to the close of probation. I've got this in the wrong place. These people are after the close of probation when they're raised. Let's say that this is the day probation is going to close. Today. And one last person is going to become a Christian. This person on this day will make it. They will receive Jesus. They will have salvation in Christ. A Seventh-day Adventist talks to this person, shows them the gospel, makes the call, and the person surrenders. And it's the real thing. They are converted. They're born again. They receive Jesus Christ. They're the last person on earth who's going to be saved. What are we going to call this person? A Methodist? A Nazarene? A Catholic? 
What are we going to call them? <laughs> They're a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> well, it's the last person on this earth who's going to be saved. The very last one. And they're a Seventh-day Adventist. Where did we get the other people that we call a multitude? <laughs> Where do we find them? There's no such person in the Bible. You either become a Seventh-day Adventist or you're lost. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, let's do this another way. <laughs> we'll forget this graph. You might do wiser to just let him try and get it out and then spin it. <laughs> These are Seventh day Adventists doing evangelism. Okay. This is their evangelism. These are Sunday keepers. Now we draw people from the world who are infidels, atheists, and all that, and we draw Sunday keepers too. We get them all. It doesn't make a difference what they are, but we get them. But when they leave these ranks, they become Seventh Day Adventists. That's what they become. Now, I'm going to ask the question a different way now. Is there a possibility... Why do they become Seventh-day Adventists? Is it because of the name or because of the truth? Okay, they become third angels people. They have the third angels, they have the third angels message. I'm not talking about joining the church. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God's system of truth in Jesus Christ which is the third angel's message. These people believe in the Sabbath. They believe in um, the sanctuary. They believe in the high priestly ministry of Jesus. They believe in overcoming. They believe in all of it. They are Seventh-day Adventists. And the reason they believe in that is because at this stage of time, all of this truth is necessary to combat the deceptions that the world has for us. So anyone becoming a Christian at this stage will have to understand about the law of God and about what is happening in the sanctuary or they cannot become a true Christian. So they will become Seventh-day Adventists Amen. by truth. Okay, all right. Now, the point is this that I'm trying to get to you so you can see why it's impossible for there to be another group. Is it possible that these people are teaching the third angel's message with everything it means? Is it possible that they teaching this truth can make these people can become a different kind of a Christian? It's not possible. It's totally illogical. It's against the Bible to teach that these people turn these people into those. <laughs> it can't be done. You will never do it in your lifetime. <laughs> now, if it can't be done, then where do they come from? They don't exist. When Jesus Christ comes back, the only people who will be alive who are Christians on the day Jesus comes back are these. All of these will have become one of those. <laughs> and so let me read it to you in early writings. What? Page 15. This is why it's so important we understand who we are as a people. We have been told things that turn us off to do evangelism. We forget they're okay. No, they're not. <laughs> Early Writings 15.
All right, early writings, page 15. While I was praying at the family altar, this is 14, and I get to 15, the Holy Ghost fell upon me, and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but could not find them. When a voice said to me, Look again, look a little higher. At this I raised my eyes, and I saw a straight and narrow path cast up high above the world. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave them light for their feet, so they might not stumble. So get the picture. The light is the pioneer message, the real one. Not what people today are calling historic Adventism. I'm sorry, that is not real Adventism, much of it. Pioneer, real Adventism had the light in 1844. And that light shone the whole path and you can't change it or it's not light anymore. It's for the whole way. <laughs> and their feet had to look at that light. They had to see where their feet were. It says, If they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, who was just before them leading into the city, they were safe. But soon some grew weary and said the city was a great way off, and they uh, expected to have entered it before. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising His glorious right arm, and from His arm came a light which waved over the Advent bed, and they shouted, Hallelujah! Others rashly denied the light behind them. I said, oh no, the pioneer movement was not entirely correct. And they said it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness. And they stumbled. They lost sight of the mark and of Jesus. They fell off the path down into the dark, wicked world below. Soon we... At this point in the book, there's a little asterisk after the word we. Arthur White put it there. Ellen White did not put this one there. Arthur White explains she just thought she was going to be there. Often in vision, she, she thought she was in the scenes. No, she's going to be there. Let's take the asterisk out. She saw the next event. She was there. The angel told her she was going to be there. <laughs> okay. It says, soon we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and the hour of Jesus coming. So that's just what Daniel 12 is trying to tell us, where we started today, that there will be a special resurrection and Ellen White will be part of it and that group will be told by God when Jesus is coming. That's what she's telling us. Now notice what she says next. We heard the voice of God like many waters which gave us the day and hour of Jesus coming. The living saints. The living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. That's the only other group. This is the wicked group. It's not saved people. <laughs> Somebody in Adventism invented a saved multitude when Jesus comes who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. And I know who it was and I know the history of it. I'm not going to go into that for you. It started in the 50s. But that one error will lead to other errors. We've got to start thinking in terms of who Jesus really is. He does not teach elitism. He teaches Christianity, humility, brotherhood. So, let's try to get to the question now. Is it possible for the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a church to be judged first and then the rest of the world afterwards? 
Let's think it through. If God could judge the Seventh-day Adventist church first and they failed, what's it going to do to them? How do you judge an organization that failed? What do you do to them? How do you execute a judgment? You burn some buildings? You throw out some trash ba baskets? Do you kick something down? What do you do to an organization that failed? Well, if you're having a problem with it, it's because it is a problem. There's nothing God could do to an organization except totally disperse it. That judgment is not organizations. The organization is about individuals, people. And if we're going to say all of the Seventh-day Adventists are judged up at this point and then probation closes for, quotes, the church, then what do we call all of these people who become Christians afterwards? It's not possible to close probation for the church because probation for the church closes here when the world's probation closes. <laughs> That's why Ezekiel 9 is said the way it is in Great Controversy 656. Now, God vindicates His law. Why? Because probation is closed for the whole world. The last Christian has come in. And now Ezekiel 9 starts. And where does it start? With the ministers of all the churches in the world who taught people to break God's law, including some unfaithful Seventh-day Adventist ministers. But that's not primarily the application. Ezekiel 9 is about the whole world, and it only happens one time. Read that page carefully in Great Controversy. It will tell you things that will hold you against all kinds of strange ideas that crept in among us. We'll go through some more of this. The book of Revelation is an eye-opener if we want to do it God's way. Okay? It seems to me, according to John, says that God the Father calls us, and Jesus said that if we're called and surrender, then we're going through with Him. So why do we need all this other stuff? I mean, to me, you're either you're either one of God's children or you're not. That's the only thing that I get out of when I read John. This last, uh, yeah, that really is the issue. Christianity. Let me give you one last thing. We need to close here. In Desire of Ages, Jesus did things a certain way. And Alan White makes this comment about the Roman Empire. He says the Roman Empire was corrupt. I mean, it was horrible. It was one government that if you wanted to talk about a government, you could talk about that one. But she says there's not a word in the Scriptures that Jesus ever did anything like that. Not a single word about that government. And she says the reason was he knew there was no solution in cutting down a government and trying to correct that. The only solution was with the individual heart. And it seems to me that we need to get that lesson. None of us are going to try to change the Adventist church as a system and change it. It can't be done. Because that's what happens when people say the Adventist church is going to be judged first. They try to, quote, save the church. No, God isn't ever... Do you know that Ellen White had this address to her over and over and over again? And one, one person reviewing Harold, she answered him so that everybody could see it. She says, do you hope to see a perfect church? She says, you will only see it in your imagination. It will never be. <laughs> she says, men are imperfect. And that's the way it is. It's the systems they run and do. That's the way it is. There will never be a perfect church on this earth. There was one fellow who thought he had it up in Idaho. He had the perfect church. Some of you, you men never met him, but I did. He had the perfect church. There were no sinners in it. It's the only way he could have a perfect church is to only have people come in that were not sinners. And they had to prove they were not sinners by telling him, I have not sinned and I will not sin and I do not sin. And they said this to each other over and over and over again. And it was really hard to get some of these people out of that because they were in a trance. They said that so often. 
No, there is no perfect church. As a matter of fact, God takes great pains to tell us the wheat and the tares will grow together until the end, which is the close of probation and then the harvest of the world. God has told us all of this. There is a church militant. There's a church triumphant. There is not another church. There's only that kind. Today, where are we? Church militant. <laughs> it's a fighting church. It's a church that has to struggle. When we reach the church triumphant, probation will have closed for the entire world and there will only be one church, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. That's Ephesians. It's impossible for there to be another multitude that's going to be saved and they don't keep the Sabbath on the day that Jesus comes. It's just not possible. So let's try to align our thinking. We all, you know, this came as a terrible shock to me when I began to find out some of these things. I learned all these things too. <laughs> and I said yes in my mind to a lot of these things. I said, they're teaching me. They're the teachers. They're the ones that know. Must be true. It wasn't until I began reading these books for myself. So wait a minute, that page doesn't go with what I was told. <laughs> and then I found another one. And another one. And another one. Then I said to myself, there's a whole system of truth in here, and it's different. And I had the joy of seeing that God has a true Seventh-day Adventist church, and it's beautiful. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, for me. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, think of people being judged. Uh, uh, I'm thinking about uh, Revelation, the seventh chapter, where they're settling into the truth. What are they settling into the truth? The Sabbath and all that, we settle into the truth that God's given unto us, and they're the ones that are going to get the loud cry and the laddering experience before probation closes for the public. So in the Adventist church, there's a remnant within a remnant. And these are the people that are settling into the truth. Now, I don't think of this, brother, as... Um, uh, um, the Adventists being judged before the public. I am thinking it as Adventists settling into the truth, as Revelation 7 says. And that, thus we will, with a... Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've, I've gone so far, and now I'm going to lose the veracity of this. I don't think of these people being judged. But settling into the truth, as Revelation the seventh chapter tells us in that saying, hurt not the earth, neither the seed nor the trees, yeah. till we have sealed. There's no problem with that. See, so yeah, we, that's fine. But those, all those, was Adam and Eve a Seventh-day Adventist? <laughs> was Adam and Eve a Seventh-day Adventist? <laughs> was uh, Abraham a Seventh-day Adventist? Was Christ a Seventh-day Adventist? Are we selecting Christ? <laughs> no problem with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just a matter of linking up here. Okay, we need to close for today. I've gone over a little bit. That was, yes, you had a... Well, I was just wondering, is, is he saying then that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church isn't going to be judged first? Because I think of the Jews, you know, when Christ said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, you know, they were judged first. The probation closed before the rest of the They world. were not the Seventh Church of the Age either. Okay, let's, let's look at that just a little bit here. Uh, the Jews had 490 years to get it right. It was a precise time prophecy. They were told that they were to bring in everlasting righteousness, all these elements. By that time, if not, it was over for them, and God told them, it is over for you as a people, as a nation, as whatever. When that prophecy is fulfilled, you're either on this side or that side of it. Very specific time. What do we have in the Adventist church like that? There isn't. Why not? There's a very real reason why it's different. When the Jews were given their mission, all those years, they only had one, really. <laughs> that was to be there 
So the Messiah could be one of them. <laughs> he had to be of the tribe of Judah. If there was no tribe of Judah, the whole thing was over. <laughs> he had to be of the tribe of Judah. When he came, Galatians 4.4 4 says, the time was fulfilled. Daniel 9 was fulfilled. He came at the precise moment. He was the precise kind of person. He was of the tribe of Judah. He fulfilled all the prophecies. Now, what does God need Israel for now? It doesn't. They have fulfilled their work. They were there for the Messiah to be born, and He was born genealogically accurately. After that, their mission is over. Except that when the Messiah did His work, they could be brought into everlasting righteousness and all of this and be the real people of God eternally. They didn't do that. So what happened to them? God divorced them. God does believe in divorce. He divorced them by their actions. They cut themselves off as a people. That's what the stoning of Stephen was all about. That was their last message to God. We don't want your ways. We don't want Jesus. We don't want to be your church. So he said, you made your choice. You're cut off. What happened next? It went to another people. Okay. Now, if the Seventh-day Adventist church were in that position, and we were, say, judged as a people, and we failed, what would God do? There's the fallacy. Every reformer out there, every dependent, independent ministry who's teaching the other errors teaches the next error. That is, God will give the message to another people. That is not in the Bible or the Spirit of Prophecy. That's why we need to study the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation says there are seven ages of the church. And what we have not understood as Adventists is the only true Adventists are the Philadelphians. And that's where it ends. There will never be another kind of church. The Laodiceans are all lost. So when the independent ministries, some of them tell us that God starts another movement, and guess who it is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's them. Always. I'm sorry, it's not in the Bible. And I have told every one of them the same thing. I don't find you in the Bible. I don't find you described. I don't find your work. I don't find anything about you in the Word of God. Where did you come from? <laughs> and I have yet to have one answer me. Folks, Seventh-day Adventism is not only a privilege, it's a necessity. <laughs> I have one last question. In a previous tape that David gave me about three weeks ago, you said that there was 13 steps to becoming a Christian. There's a conversion taking place. I was wondering if you could talk about that. The last question was that, brother? <laughs> last question was repeat. Well, we until <laughs> next week. Okay, we, we can't today, but uh, we'll try to weave it in. That's the selected message. I'll give you a page next time. You can study it out. Okay, we really need to close. I don't want these meetings to get out of hand here. But I can see that we needed to get to the book of Revelation. <laughs> We have some ideas that we need to square with what the Word says. And it doesn't matter how faithful some of the pioneers were. They didn't see everything in very specific areas. They did their work faithfully. They did everything they were showing up to that time. But there's more to build on that. And start seeing a little bit more now. It's time. We need to know who we are as a people. You know the Spirit of Prophecy never trips up. Ever. Ever. If you find a sentence that doesn't fit what you believe, guess what has to change? <laughs> We're all in the same boat. <laughs> I've been there, and I try to do it every day, every day. I try to see, will my beliefs square with that? Do I really see that and understand it? We need to stretch all the time, because some very well-meaning people have just repeated what they were told, and they never chucked it out. We can't afford that. That's where evolutionists come from. They never go back to check to see if the groundwork was done. <laughs> okay, let's hang in here with each other. Ask the hard questions. Let's deal with things. Study! <laughs> All right, let's pray.
Father, we thank you that you're not going to take us to heaven because we're theologians, because we figured out all the answers, because we had 4,000 facts we could draw on. We're only going to be there for one reason. Jesus is worthy. We thank you, Lord, that it's only his merit that counts. Help us not to fight for things we don't even understand ourselves. Help us not to be in a place where we're going to defend truth when truth doesn't need it. But help us, Lord, to be open and inquiring to hear your Spirit speaking to us, that we may obey as individuals, that we may learn what you want us to know as a person. We thank you, Lord, that in your great plan you've made room for every one of us. You love us, each one, as though we were the only one. And we thank you as we talk together that we will be here in a spirit of investigation, not of trying to prove anything. None of us can prove anything, Lord. Only your Spirit can bring to us the things we need to know. But keep us, Lord, in a place where we are open to investigate. Ellen White once told us that where there is not a spirit of investigation, she wants to flee that place. Help us never to go there. Help us to be where you can speak to us and we can be reasonable with each other, where we can share our ideas, and then we have to leave it to each other to study and to have your Spirit speak to us. We thank you that we have that freedom. Bless us as we learn what Protestantism really is. That's between the individual and the conscience and the Word of God. Bless us as we learn what you're trying to teach us. Help us to be the true brotherhood and help us to lift each other up. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.